Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us pray together. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Well, have you ever been driving around town and in the distance at the intersection you see a panhandler with his makeshift sign? Boy, in Charlotte, they're everywhere. My guess is you've seen them here too. We've all seen them. Yet to avoid having to stop where he is and he's right there at your window, have you ever moved over to the fur furthest lane? Maybe pretended to look for something on the floorboard when you get there just so you don't see his gaze? Maybe I'm the only one. Sometimes we'd rather not deal with people who are so needy. Well, speaking of needy, ten lepers are on the outskirts of town. And due to their infection and their deformities and their contagion, they keep their distance. The law demanded that lepers not engage with others, except to warn them of their presence by shouting, unclean, unclean. This was the original social distancing, beloved, where people quickly got into the other lane. Because they're lepers. And you certainly did not want to catch what they had. However, when the ten lepers learn that Jesus is approaching, they offer a plea for help. Their cry is mercy. That's what help means. Mercy. Help me. Have mercy on us. And so the question becomes, what will Jesus do? Will he avoid them like everybody else does? Of course not. Jesus hears them, he sees them, and he responds. Though our Lord does not immediately heal them. He could have, but in keeping with the Old Testament law, he tells the lepers to go show themselves to the priests who would then examine them and then perform a rite, R-I-T-E, a rite of purification, a rite of cleansing. And the priest would then pronounce them clean. Now priests knew how to do this from Leviticus chapter 14. They had no doubt read it numerous times, but they had never used it and never needed to. You see, because outside of Moses, who contracted, do you recall, he contracted leprosy for just a few moments when he put his hand into his breast and then pulled it back out and it was leprous and the Lord told him to put it back in. Outside of Moses' sister, Miriam, getting leprosy and then she was healed. And outside of Naaman, that general, one who dipped himself into the Jordan River seven times, outside of those three, no one was ever healed of leprosy. Just imagine, this is silly, but uh, imagine a, there somewhere in the temple courtyard, what have you, it's a red box with a glass case over it that's got Leviticus 14, in case of leprosy, break glass. Nobody ever broke the glass. Because man could not cure leprosy. Outside of those three that I mentioned, no one was ever healed of leprosy. The only hope that a leper had was a miracle. Which is exactly what these ten lepers receive. For as they are going... When the Lord says, go show yourself to the priest, as they are going, they're healed. Now imagine that feeling 
returns to them as they start making their way to the priest. Legions that were no doubt all over their skin begin to vanish. Skin is restored. Extremities like fingers and toes, even noses, they reconstitute themselves. The contagion is gone. And as they feel it themselves, as they see it with each other, my guess is they pick up the pace. They start running. Because getting to the priest and being declared A-OK -okay meant they could go home. They could go back to the hugs and the affection of wives and children. They could go back to work. They could go back to synagogue. However, this healing brought all ten men to a fork in the road, and it really was a choice between two paths. One path led away from Jesus, the man whom they just called Master, path that led straight to the priests. And as I've already said, the priests couldn't heal anyone. They could only pronounce a man clean or unclean. They had no remedy for uncleanness. This path would carry them back to the law. The same law that proclaimed them unclean to begin with. Sure, they'd be readmitted back into society and they would live out their lives until they returned to the dust from which all men are made. However, the other path, the other way, is back to Jesus. This is the path of wisdom that Solomon speaks of. Thus, in all of the excitement, in all of the enthusiasm of the moment, nine continue on their path, yet one pauses and abandons the path the others are on, and he turns and he takes the path back. Falling upon his face, he thanks Jesus with his entire being. And so it is with the kingdom of God, is it not? The way of salvation is the narrow gate. It is the path that passes through the eye of the needle. It is the way of the remnant, the small part sundered off from the masses, seen very clearly right here in our text. Just one of ten. The other nine turn their back on Jesus and they head for the priest. Sure, in their desperation, they believe for a moment, but then being healed, their faith died. But not so for this one. He turned his back on the other men. He turned his back on the village. He turned his back on all that it afforded him reversing his original course. And what is his race? Samaritan. What were the other nine? Israelite. It recalls that verse that Jesus came unto his own and his own received him not. The Samaritan realized that the only person who heals leprosy is God Almighty. And now God Almighty was standing right before him in the person of Jesus of Nazareth. And so this man is doing what faith always does, going to Jesus, the source of his faith. Now by way of review, how many had the dreaded disease? All ten. How many heard about Jesus and made their plea for mercy? All ten. How many were healed? All ten. But nine went their way without Jesus, whereas one is compelled to turn back and didn't want to leave him. And as a result of that, he is healed differently. 
It's not just in his body, but his soul is healed by God's word. This is where I differ with our English translations. It's not that your faith has healed you. It's your faith, Jesus says, has saved you. This man has no need of the priests, not being a Samaritan. He's returned to the true priest, the great high priest, the author and perfecter of salvation. Now look, folks, we're infected with a devastating disease of our own, and I'm not talking about COVID. What a relief when you get tested for COVID and the results come back on your phone negative. However, when it comes to our sin nature, we test positive, and it's killing us. We are, by nature, as we have already confessed, sinful and unclean before God. We have a flesh that is prone towards that same list that we heard from St. Paul, namely the contagion of adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, the disfigurement of idolatry and sorcery, hatred, contentions, and jealousies, the rottenness of outbursts of wrath and selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, and revelries. That's us! No man holds the cue. But then, just like the ten lepers, we heard the good news about Jesus. How he encountered human flesh in its most horrible condition, and he took on flesh to save you. And he did it by suffering his flesh to be infected by the legions of the scourge. He did it by being put outside of Jerusalem, counted as unclean, to hang condemned on Golgotha's cross, covered in your sin, covered in your death. And although he cried out, just like the lepers did, no one answered his cry. No one healed him. No one saved him. Praise be to God, he's not dead. Just as he healed the ten lepers by his own power, so did he of his own power take up his life again. Thus it is he, the risen Christ, who is the door. It is he who opens to you the way of salvation, for he is the way, leading you to what Solomon called the right path. The path of the just, the path that shines brighter and brighter until the perfect day, the last day when Christ's church will be ushered into her heavenly home. And so you, just like the ten, you heard. You were baptized. And you were cleansed of your sin. And even though you still carry around the leprous sinful flesh, you are clothed in the righteousness of Christ. And you are clean in the sight of God. And so you this morning, like the Samaritan himself, himself, you have returned again. You have come to where needy people come in faith, praying for and seeking God's mercy. How, how do I know that? Because I heard you sing it. Lord, have mercy upon us. Christ, have mercy upon us. Lord, have, help us. I heard you. I sang it with you. And gratefully, this is what he freely gives, whereby you offer your thanks for the mercy that he has shown you. Gratefully, you're not like the others who put Jesus in the rearview mirror of their life and walked a different path away from him. You are like the Samaritan 
who fell at Jesus' feet. And what you hear your Lord say to you is, rise and go. Your faith has saved you. God confronts us all today with these men, with the nine who go about their own lives and with the one who turns back to Jesus. And so we pray for those who have turned away, which are many. But for us, know that our merciful Lord Christ has come near again to you today in both word and sacrament because he knows you need his forgiveness again. He knows you need his strength and his grace. He knows your flesh is strong and tugs at you to indulge in wickedness, to pursue your own self-interest and to turn Jesus into an afterthought in your life. But know that he has come near to help, to forgive, to strengthen, and also to receive your thanks as you gather around him at his holy table in his Eucharist where he is truly present for you. Beloved, faith cometh by hearing. And your faith has saved you. In the holy name of Jesus, amen. We stand